ろんな意味でその世界は中国の台頭に関心を寄せていて、まあ、日本の新聞を見てもその中国に咲くスペースというのは非常に大きいかと思うんですけどもあのそれと同じくらいですねおそらくそのアメリカが中国をどう見ているのかという、まあ、当然あの、まあ、日本にとってアメリカというのはあの特別な意味を持つ国なわけですけどもそのアメリカが中国をどう見ているかということも別に日本だけではなくて世界中が注目しているんだろうと思うんですね。で、そういう時にそのそのここにいる彼らの言説がそのアメリカにおける中国イメージをまあ形成するこの重要な素材の一つになっているっていう意味で、あの今日あの貴重なお話をあのたくさん伺うことができると思うんですが、あの4人にこの概ね共通して4つぐらいのあの3つぐらいですかね、3つぐらいの点についてあのまあ質問を投げかけて、あのまあ1つ目が習近平体制後の,あの中国のまあメディア事情みたいなことについて触れてもらえたらということとあと、ああこれはあの各自その濃淡があるかもしれないですけどもまあインターネットのインパクトといいますか中国社会まあソーシャルメディアインターネットのインパクトみたいなことをどう考えたらいいのかということそれからまあ実際に中国にいて中国を見てきてであのまあ日本であの1週間いろんな人と話して。まあ、日本とアメリカで中国にどう接していけばいいのかもしくは日本に対してどういうメッセージがある,あるのかみたいなこともまあそれは質疑応答の部分になってくるかもしれないですけどもそういうことについてあの何らかの形でお触,れいただあの触れていただければということでまあこれは事前に質問をえっと投げてまあそれに対してお答えいただくとであの具体的にあのお話のまあテーマみたいなものをいただいているので私の方から簡単にそのご紹介しますと。あのニューヨーク・タイムズのアンスフィールドさんは、まあ、市場の力と外国メディアが中国,のその中国を、まあ、どう変えていったのかというような点についてお話しいただけるということですそれからアルジャジーラ,ジーラの,あのチャンさんからはあの中国人が、まあ、その中国政府、まあ、共産党を、えー、どう見ているのかとでそういうイメージがどうやってその形成されたのかでさらにまあそのアルジャジーラということでこのアラブの春に似たような動きがあの中国内であの見ることができるのか今後そういうことが生まれてくる可能性があるのかみたいなことですねについてお話しいただいてでエコノミストのエプスタインさんにはあのインターネットの効果ソーシャルメディアの,その効果影響に特化してお話しいただけるということでこれはまあそのアラブの春ともちょっと関係してくるかもしれないですけども。それから最後にフォーレンポリシーのフィッシュさんには、まあ、中あの主として外交といいますか対外政策、中国人の世界観、北朝鮮、日本、アメリカをどういうふうに見ているかというようなあの観点からあのそれぞれ10分ずつお話しいただけるということで、えー、早速、えー、ニューヨーク・タイムズのアンスフィールドさんからどうぞよろしくお願いします。Uh, thank you, thank you,、uh, Dr. Nakayama. And、uh, on behalf of my colleagues, I'd also、um, like to thank the、uh, Sasakawa Peace Foundation for hosting us.、Um, we've had a very enlightening few days, and, um, and, and we're very happy to be here, and so thank you for coming.、Um, actually, I, follow, I spend most of my time as a reporter following、uh, Chinese politics and leadership issues, and obviously, the, the, past, the past year or two have been,、uh, I think, the Probably the most exciting、uh, period since I first arrived、um, in Beijing, which was back in 1995.、Um, it's generated a lot of debate amongst the chattering classes about who's up and who's down and what sort of possibilities、um, might be forthcoming.、Um, and so I thought I'd stick, stick a little bit closer、uh, to the news than maybe was originally、uh, slated and, and talk about the most recent、um, thing that we were covering, which is the trial of, of Bo Xilai,、um, and sort of and use that to sort of Take a look at what, what the,、uh, the political framework is right now and what the dynamics have been over the past, past year.、Um, as, as you might know, Bo, was, Bo, Bo Xilai was a fallen Communist Party Politburo member,、uh, son of a revolutionary leader, became a populist icon、uh, of China's new left, and is probably one of the most controversial, divisive,、um, and ambitious、uh, politicians of, of his time.、Um, And,、uh, and I think if you look at the,、uh, the takedown of Bo and the trial and how they've gone about these events, you can see a lot of the pressures and challenges、uh, that the party leadership under Xi Jinping is facing、um, and some of the mixed signals that they might be、uh, sending as they try to、uh, you know, obviously maintain and enhance their, their ability to govern, as they put it.、Um, 
So, so Bo was, you know, Bo, as you might, just to give you a little bit of background, he was ch challenging for a seat on the top, topmost leadership uh, with the party congress last year until this very strange uh, series of events unfolded uh, in which his former police chief fled to the U.S. Embassy in Chengdu in western China and told the Americans about how his wife had murdered a British businessman. Um, so now he's charged with abuse of power uh, and corruption. Um, but most, most political insiders view this case uh, as in his fall as sort of as a political purge, essentially, of an official uh, who made too many enemies, who challenged party norms and discipline, uh, became a threat uh, to many of his peers, including uh, Xi Jinping, the new leader. Um, so I was in, actually, I was in Jinan, uh, east, eastern China, uh, two weeks ago to cover the trial. Uh, we were expecting a very closed door uh, affair, uh, which typically the corrupt, corrupt official is a broken down man and is confesses and expresses remorse and says little more before being jailed. Um, but obviously, uh, as you might know, if you followed the news the, the, the past couple of weeks, this was not uh, the typical show trial. Um, it was a very unique spectacle um, that played out before the Chinese public in live fashion. Uh, five days, um, edited transcripts of the proceedings were released over uh, Weibo, which is China's Twitter. Um, and it was, it was sort of as, as live and, and uh, as live a performance as anything we've seen since in China since the, the trial of uh, the Gang of Four and Madame Mao um, back in, in 1980. Um, Bo, there was uh, certainly the, the, authorities, the authorities took a lot of pains basically to present as plausible, as realistic uh, a, a trial, as, as much, as, as, do as much as possible to show, show that uh, Bo Xilai was getting a fair trial. Um, a lot, of, a lot of testimony was presented. Uh, Bo Xilai and his lawyer were allowed to cross-examine witnesses. They were, uh, they were, they were allowed to Bo ridiculed the, the character and the testimony um, of, of, of many of the witnesses. Um, he, he, didn't, uh, he, did, he said that he actually said that he only admitted one charge, uh, one of the charges under pressure from party investigators, um, which is quite sens a sensitive thing to raise. Um, and he even, he even had touched on the illicit affairs uh, that occurred between him and other women that uh, might have occurred or seemed to have occurred between his wife and his, uh, his, his, this former police chief of his, Wang Lijun. Um, so what was interesting was that on the one hand, Bo, Bo Xilai didn't, didn't exactly come off uh, looking like the cleanest of people. Um, uh, and it was sort of a soap opera. Um, but in a way, his renown and his sort of cult figure status, um, some arguably might have grown through this. Uh, the uh, Reuters, Reuters news agency actually reported that uh, there, was a, there was a sort of a, an impromptu poll that was taken on, on Chinese uh, social media that showed that, he had, that many people, the people responded, had a vastly improved um, image, um, impression of Bo, of Bo Xilai than they did before. So the question is sort of, why, what was the leadership thinking? Um, why would they ch take this risk? Um, and so I, I thought I'd just sort of touch on a few points um, that the trial brought out, um, show more generally um, why this in some ways is, is, in their, is actually in their interest um, to take this sort of different approach. Um, I think one, one, was, one of the factors that was operating was this need for the, the Communist Party, uh, the Communist Party leadership to, to uh, to preserve solidarity, um, to, dif to dif diffuse high-level tensions, um, the, the leadership generally under Xi Jinping has has asserted itself relatively strongly um, in, in many ways, but it's still recovering from a very brutal um, and highly contested transition process over the last two years. Um, so they're highly attuned to the need to sort of accommodate different uh, different forces within within the party. And so I'd suggest that the leadership didn't, basically my reporting indicated that the leadership didn't make this decision to put the trial proceedings online and let Mr. Bo have a say with just merely to entertain people. They were in a way forced, um, forced to, uh, to let him have a say because they didn't have his full cooperation and they realized that there were a lot of people, supporters as well as ordinary people who still, uh, within the party as well as among citizens, uh, who still uh, who wanted to see him have a say, and they needed to um, convince them that he, they had gotten enough of a fair trial. Um, 
they, they, risk, they faced a risk that if he didn't get a more open trial that he would, could become more of a potential martyr. Um, they also agreed, it seemed, that the, that, that the party would, o the, the trial would only sort of, uh, uh, wouldn't address the broader politics that were going on behind the scenes and some of the political struggles. So while, while many of the, while many sort of dirty things came out, it was all sort of basically um, focused upon these charges. Um, and I think one of the interesting things that happened right before the trial, uh, right before the, the prosecution um, uh, released the charges against Bo in, in late July, um, Jiang Zemin, uh, the uh, third generation leader of China, uh, who was seen as, as partly a patron of, of Bo Xilai, as well as the new leader, Xi Jinping, uh, came out and sort of and had a, uh, in, in um, the foreign ministry of China, Chinese foreign minister released a statement in which he sort of, he, he had met uh, Henry Kissinger. Um, and so it was a very odd thing. You don't see these sorts of statements released very often. Uh, but in that statement, it was a transcript of their con some of their conversation. And he said that, uh, Jiang Zemin said that Xi Jinping is a very wise and capable leader. Um, and then the next day, uh, this, this, uh, the prosecution came out with the charges. So this was a sign, this was a sign to many that, um, that, that Jiang Zemin was sort of, uh, the patronage of leadership is obviously very important. Senior leaders, retired leaders is very important and that he was sort of behind um, the process. So, so that was one thing. Another thing, another, th another point that came out of the, um, of the trial was, uh, was obviously the need to sort of, uh, for the party to uh, press ahead with this corruption fight. Um, Xi Jinping has made fighting corruption, um, decadence with the part within the party and government and the military, uh, really the top focus um, from the start. Um, they've emphasized that again and again that uh, the fight against corruption is critical to the survival um, of the party. And uh, in the second half of this year, he's launched a new, what they call a mass line rectification campaign. Um, it's really on the, surf on the face of it about getting back to the party's core values um, and so forth. So um, the statements about Bo, about Bo Xilai that have come out of the state media have really emphasized that no one is, no one is exempt, that, uh, that Bo was uh, basically suggested that Bo is someone who didn't um, follow the, the central didn't follow the sort of the uh, who fell out of line with party discipline and with central command, um, and so it, it was an important message um, to get across. Um, the other the other thing is that you know corruption corruption campaigns have often been used by the party to as a means as a tool a very powerful tool to consolidate uh, to consolidate their uh, power. So for Xi Jinping, um, the Bo Xi like is sort of a an early climax of, um, of that attempt. They've already, in the first uh, nine or 10 months of, of, of the new leadership, they've taken down, uh, investigated already nine um, uh, ministry level officials um, and who they are calling tigers. Um, they're talking about fighting tigers and flies. Um, tigers are obviously powerful officials. Uh, flies are the rank and file. Um, and so, there's, uh, there's an active attempt to legitimize um, that. Um, one of the other, another Jonathan, aspect. Jonathan, you have sorry, two more minutes. Two minutes, yeah. okay, okay. So just two more points, I think. One is, um, one, one is the aspect, there, there, there isn't, there, on the, while, while China is, is, is carrying out this very strong um, campaign against uh, corruption, uh, there is, there has been an attempt uh, throughout the, the course of the new leadership to sort of Give uh, to pay lip service to um, strengthening the rule of law, um, to protecting uh, China's consti China's constitution, which does um, again on, on on the face of it uh, guarantee some ba basic liberties, and um, and so the, so the leadership is trying to sort of strike a balance, and having a, a more open proceeding um, can sort of achieve that um, to an extent. Uh, can, can help achieve, uh, you know, a certain amount of good pub good publicity. Um, there is a meta. There is a sort of a, a debate going on right now whether this, to what extent, this trial has marked progress for the rule of law. Um, and uh, I don't know if you, we've come down in the New York Times. We've come down pretty cynically, um, I think, on on this question, or, or, or sort of negatively on the question. And the reason is that while this sort of this 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 sort of um, attempt at 
at openness uh, is certainly, um, I think, better than, you know, all, on, the, on the whole, better, better than what we've seen before, um, is good for, you know, sort of, uh, I think, is, has, has won a lot of um, plaudits from um, liberal critics, um, for sure. Uh, at the end of the day, um, the condition underlying it is that the verdict, the verdict in these things is pre-decided. And so what is a trial? If the, you know, we say that the jury's still out, but in the case of a Chinese show trial, the jury's not out. <laughs> the jury's in. Uh, there is no jury, actually. Um, and so the verdict is, is decided. So at the end of the day, if you have this uh, you know, a show trial, even if it's a very more sophisticated show trial, it's still a sh show trial. So I've been asked to talk about Chinese people's views of their government and the factors that shape those views. And of course, uh, that's a pretty big topic for 10 minutes. There are 1.3 billion Chinese. And um, how do you possibly encapsulate the different opinions uh, the people have towards their government? Uh, but I think the best way to do this is just to get a little bit personal and talk about my experiences speaking with different people. I was in China from 2007 to 2012 for five years with Al Jazeera. We traveled a lot. We were based out of Beijing, but we traveled to different cities and to the countryside. I filed something like 400 reports during that time period and spoke to people from all walks of life, some very rich and powerful, and some who were incredibly poor. And if I think about my time at the beginning, my first year, and compare it to my last year, one thing I can say qualitatively, so this is not scientific, again, uh, this is anecdotally, uh, but the sense I got was that things have gotten worse and people are more dissatisfied in general uh, towards their government. One thing that I noticed that I thought was very interesting is a, a very common uh, theme in uh, news on China that you probably have read about is the troubling problem with l illegal land seizures that the government, uh, local governments in China conduct. They go and uh, take land in the countryside for development into residential commercial properties or to urbanize an area. And they often do this under dubious circumstances in which farmers are not entirely properly compensated, and so there is a lot of dissatisfaction uh, from rural peoples. In the beginning, uh, I was definitely, of course, very interested in this story, and we would try to look for these stories, and, and we found some of them. But one thing I noticed in my last year in China was that, I don't want to say everywhere, but a lot of places I went to, if we were doing, it didn't matter what story we were working on. I could be working on a story on the environment, on business and manufacturing, on a social trend. So we would be traveling for a totally different story, but as I talked to the locals, the issue of illegal land seizure would come up. So in other words, everywhere I was going, it didn't matter what story I was doing, this would almost all the time come up unsolicited. Uh, we weren't asking particularly, but I started asking because, and, and, and the thing is, it felt like everyone knew somebody or knew some village or had some connection to some grievance related to the illegal land uh, seizure case. And in fact, on a personal note, um, my grandparents came from Guangdong province and um, our own village um, and our, my own ancestors' graves also uh, fell under uh, difficulties in the, in the past few years in terms of a legal land sale that affected the family ancestral grave. So it touched to um, me personally as well. So I think that gives you an idea of the state. And of course, um, in the past couple of days uh, in our meetings, I get the sense that a lot of Japanese are aware of those who follow China of the, uh, by the government's own admission, tens of thousands of protests that take place in China every year. And that number is growing. And I think that the illegal land seizure issue is connected to that. Now, having said that, um, 
I've gotten a sense of a little bit of wishful thinking um, that this is an implication that there is an instability that will grow to a national level and um, you know, connecting it to the Arab Spring thing that uh, perhaps China would face something like the Arab Spring thing. And I want to step back and qualify everything I've just said by saying that a lot of these protests are local. I mean, uh, most of them are. So people are unhappy but they keep it to a local level. You know, they don't get ideological on you. And, and they, they'll say, these corrupt officials locally, they've taken our land, we're very, very unhappy. Uh, but they won't say, well, this is a problem with Beijing. This is a problem with the Communist Party. Uh, they, they don't expand it to that level, perhaps because they realize that if they do bring it up to that level, they'll get in much bigger trouble. Um, so perhaps there's a little bit of self-censorship with that. But um, I, I do want to qualify what I've said. Yes, there are more protests, uh, but um, you know, they, are not, they don't seem to me to be trending towards something that could uh, create an Arab Spring anytime soon. I mean, the other thing is, you know, certainly working for Al Jazeera, we get that question a lot. Um, I would say that the Chinese state security apparatus is a lot more sophisticated than many of the governments in the Middle East. Um, you know, I, I just remember the example during the Egyptian revolution uh, and the fall of Mubarak that uh, Egyptian state security people were um, approaching activists and asking, and, and the, these activists were planning uh, protests and sending that message through Facebook. And the Egyptian state security would go to these activists and interrogate them and say, close down Facebook, shut down Facebook, in, in a way that clearly indicated that they didn't understand how that social platform and social website worked. The Chinese government does not have that problem. And in fact, uh, Gadi will be talking about how not only do they know what Twitter is, they've got their own version that they can uh, control better. Um, so that's, that's one thing I wanted to touch upon. Uh, let's see how much time. The other thing I wanted to say is that no matter how unhappy people are, um, I do want to qualify the discussion of protests in the context of uh, the fact that um, you know, again, people complain about things at a local level, they're afraid to bring it up to the higher level. Um, and you do have to factor in the fact that, you know, 12 years of a certain type of public education that takes place in China. It is propaganda. Would I say it is brainwashing? I would say that, you know, um, it, you know, Chinese have very strong opinions. There are different opinions out there. They can clearly think for themselves and think critically. but you still have to think about the fact that they've come from this 12-year public school environment in which they, um, you know, one thing that I, I get a lot of when I speak to them is um, they feel that foreign media is criticizing their country. Uh, they have been conditioned or taught and the Communist Party has been very successful in teaching them the concept or confusing them with the concept that criticism of the government is same as criticism of the country. Whereas for m many people outside of China, we, we see a difference between um, criticism of our government and then criticism on a personal level uh, you know, to uh, Americans or whatnot. So, so that's something that, um, you know, um, that I see. And I just kind of want to end by providing a, an, an anecdote. Um, there was somebody that I interviewed once, and it was a story where this farmer um, had been screwed by his government in every possible way. In other words, you know, he had his land taken from him, he lost his money, um, one of his sons were, was badly beaten, um, and you know, basically he lost everything, and he was brought down, down, down. The system had failed him, and we were there to interview him. And we set up the camera, we put up the lights, you know, and right before we start, started recording, he paused and he looked at me and said, wait, is this going to make China look bad? And frankly, in my opinion, if something, if my government treated me that way, I would owe no allegiance or loyalty to my country in that way. But he still conflated the two things, you know, somebody like that. He still combined the concept of loyalty to country to loyalty to government. And I, I was so struck by that. 
um, he did go ahead and do the interview, but um, you know, somebody in that position to still consider his love for China and also um, not see the fact that there is a difference between the Communist Party and uh, the country, I thought was interesting. Um, and I guess I should add, you know, it's important to keep in mind that uh, there are about 80 million members of the Communist Party. This is not a party that uh, is failing in, in number of members. That's a lot of people. And um, we, we have to keep that in mind, too. Uh, lots of people, if you ask them, you know, um, if they're unhappy with their government in any country, will, will, will um, complain about their government, even here, right? Um, and I would, you know, I would argue that, of course, I think the situation in China is a lot uh, more serious. There's a lot more reason to complain about, but, um, you know, they, uh, they, they complain, but if you ask them, okay, well, do you want to get rid of the single party system? What is the alternative? Would you like democracy? And that's where you usually get the long pause. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of wishful thinking that the Chinese secretly wanted democracy and, you know, they complain a lot and there's all these tens of thousands of protests, but I think everything is sort of qualified. So that's the best I can do uh, to talk about 1.3 billion people in 10 minutes. Hopefully that is somewhat helpful. Thanks, Toshi, uh, and thanks to the uh, Sasakawa Peace Foundation for, for having us all here. We've had a, a very interesting week um, meeting with um, um, legislators and diplomats and, uh, and experts um, about Japan and China. Um, so I appreciate that and appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak before you. Uh, I'm talking about the internet, um, China's internet, which is actually different from the internet in the rest of the world, uh, and quite intentionally so. Uh, and uh, I want to talk about how that internet has grown uh, in China, I think uh, in some cases against expectations, uh, and also how China has managed the internet, also um, I think exceeding expectations or defying expectations. Uh, Bill Clinton in 2000, when he was president, uh, said uh, that trying to control the internet, talking about China now, would be like trying to nail jello against the wall. Um, back then when he said it, I think people uh, kind of believed that. Uh, and, even, and back then, China only had not even 20 million people on the internet. Uh, 13 years later, there are 600 million Chinese online. Um, and the way they use the internet is so much more dynamic and interactive than it was in the year 2000. Um, and the people who are using it, the, the demographics are much broader. Now you do have people in the countryside where the growth of users is fastest. Um, you have back then just you know your classic kind of urban, well-educated or you know college kids online. Now it's a much broader base. And yet China is managing this process, and they have actually been doing that from the beginning. Uh, from close to the beginning with aggressive efforts at censorship, uh, with blocking of foreign websites. Uh, you've, most of you, I'm sure, have heard of the great firewall that they do they use to block Facebook, uh, YouTube, um, Twitter. And in their place, they have fostered Chinese versions of these companies. Uh, Renren for Facebook, uh, Yoku, uh, Yoku Tudo for uh, YouTube, um, and Weibo, several versions of this thing called Weibo uh, for, uh, for Twitter. And of course, these folks have employ uh, in, in total thousands and thousands of, of people to monitor what people post on the internet. They use automated filtering uh, software to help them uh, uh, shut down conversations when they, when, before they can go viral or at least shortly afterwards. Uh, they. Um, uh, they, their efforts are um, extensive, and they're smart. They're focused. So, for instance, they're much more interested. You know, you can actually say critical things about the government on the Chinese internet. I think you'd be surprised after hearing. I'm sure you all, have, many of you, heard how much China censors its internet. I think you'd be surprised at how dynamic the discussion is, how much humor and cynicism and irony is used on the Chinese internet. But when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to people organizing or uh, maybe uh, something that would threaten collective action, 
then they shut down sound very quickly. So I'll give a recent example. Uh, Toshi's brought up the uh, Arab Spring. Uh, there was the, uh, you know, when the Jasmine Revolution was going on in the Middle East, uh, there was uh, a nascent, uh, a small attempt, it seemed, to try and start something in China online and organize it. Um, there was a, a severe crackdown on social media. Uh, there was a aggressive presence, police presence offline as well uh, at sites where people might gather. But the online reaction was very strong and some people might have felt an overreaction, but their, um, but their strategy was to, 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 to stop any sort of potential action in the, what they called the embryonic stage uh, before it becomes anything. And this strategy is employed offline and online, and it's been since, since the beginning. In fact, the very first effort to, to do this with the, with the internet uh, happened in relation to the Senkakus in 1996 in the Senkaku Islands. There was a, um, there was an, a, an attempt to organize uh, protests, or it's, it was fomenting, on a university, uh, like a forum, online forum, what we call a BBS, uh, what the Chinese call BBS. And uh, they shut down that Peking University forum. And at this time, there were not even 80,000 people on the internet in all of China. But they were afraid of this potential for the internet to switch something on in terms of people protesting or fomenting opinion, fomenting some sort of anger, even though it was actually going to be against Japan and ostensibly pro-government. Uh, they don't want that kind of uh, protest that, that's not under their control or some under their influence. And that gets at the, the other aspect, this, this notion that you can, that the internet has become a place where people can express public opinion and has become a public square. Uh, the really the first that China has ever had, a place where people of average uh, means can express themselves and where people who have no government uh, position can become influential. Uh, you have people online on Weibo who have literally uh, 10 million or more followers. The, the, the guy with the most has more than 50 million people following his Weibo account. Uh, so these are, these are people that the government has, has some concern about. Um, so they have multiple strategies to deal with this. Um, one is, is the censorship I'm talking about and also managing closely those people or trying to manage relations with those, with those people. But another is to have their own voice, to participate in the public square. Um, in other words, to use the internet as a, as a megaphone um, for propaganda, um, both officially, like at the government level, and also uh, less, uh, less publicly, less officially uh, via uh, propagandists, uh, you know, freelance and paid propagandists. Uh, there, you may have heard, some of you may have heard of something called the 50 cent party in China. These are people who are paid 50 Chinese cents for each post that they make, uh, either supportive of the government or distracting from whatever the ongoing controversy is online. But these instructions to these folks uh, go out all the time. Um, and they are um, in cities throughout China. It's not just about national issues, but also local ones. Um, this, the Chinese internet is not just one, uh, uh, one space that the government manages from Beijing. Um, they are managing it everywhere. Uh, and if we're talking about a massive amount of people devoted to this effort, between censorship, propagandists, um, uh, government Weibo accounts. I mean, talking about uh, a massive investment in this to try and manage um, the Chinese internet and the evolution of it. Um, so the question is, how successful can they be? Um, this has been a challenge for them because to participate in that public discussion, they have to have, now it's not just being on TV or radio and, and broadcasting your message. Now you have to respond or you have a response to you uh, that can be cynical, that can undercut your message. So, you know, uh, Xi Jinping has talked about the China dream or the Chinese dream. Well, uh, they put out an online poll uh, shortly after he rolled this out. It, and uh, basically it was sort of a, a list of questions about whether, do you agree that the Communist Party has done X in support of, you know, and kind of to advance the Chinese dream? Questions like this. And on every question, there was like five of them, 
the, I think the best answer they got was like, the best level of support they got was 30% in favor of what they were proposing, what they were, um, what they were suggesting the Communist Party has done for the Chinese people. Mostly it was 75, 80% against. And then they just took down that, that poll. Um, and whenever, uh, whenever they do have this kind of rhetoric, there are jokes and online, and, and uh, even if they can get around censorship by using homonyms uh, and uh, characters that aren't uh, exact, you know, you, uh, sensor, uh, characters that can get around automatic filtering. Uh, so there's all sorts of clever ways that, that can be undercut. And so they have to be smarter about it. But um, my contention is that this has forced them to be smarter, to be smarter authoritarians. Overall, this dynamic has forced them to, to confront public opinion that although some of it is engendered by the internet, would, would exist anyways without the internet. Um, you know, cynicism, the, the people that she's talking to, they don't need the internet to tell them that they're unhappy that their land has been taken. Um, they, um, but now, so now the government has more ways to listen to the people and to try and respond, and they're forced to be smarter about it. Um, I, so I'll conclude with this. This week, uh, we've, we've heard from a few people who predict that the, eventually the Chinese economy, Chinese system will collapse, uh, that it's unsustainable in its current form. Uh, now, I've heard that before, um, and it may well be true. Uh, and the question is, though, is the internet sp speeding that up, the Chinese internet? Is it speeding that up, or is it slowing it down? And my contention is uh, that it may be slowing it down, giving them more, buying them more time. Um, I mean, obviously that remains to be seen, and there's no way to prove that. There's no way to show the counterfactual of if, if you have all of these problems, the social problems they have without an internet, what would that look like? Um, but uh, that is not to say that they're not afraid, they're not constantly vigilant. And this year, in the new, under the new leadership, their approach has been to be even more vigilant. Um, We've, they've, they've cracked down on those, what we call those, those uh, what they call the big Vs, the people who are verified users who have tens of millions of followers. They're, uh, they've, they're trying to bring them into line to, be, to behave themselves on the internet. They've arrested activists who expose people, local corrupt officials. Uh, you know, you may have heard of uh, scandals where someone's wearing a luxury watch and that picture gets posted online. Uh, they've, they've cracked down on people who who get involved in that activism online. Uh, so they're, um, they're scared, but uh, they're, they're managing it. And I think what they're trying to do is build a, or maintain uh, what I call a, a giant cage to contain um, this playground of the Chinese internet. You can play, but there's still bars. Um, and uh, they're strengthening those bars. Thank you. So as journalists, part of our responsibility is to take hugely complex things, uh, country, uh, people, and simplify and condense them into something that you can communicate over the space of an article or over the space of a 10-minute presentation. So with that in mind, I'm going to try to condense everything I'm going to be saying about China and its place in the world to just one word, uh, and that is the word for China itself, uh, central country or middle country. And if you look back at China's history over the last, you know, over the last thousand years, but especially over the last couple of hundred years, um, from, say, 1840 to 1980, it's had a really, really rough patch, uh, you know, the sick man of Asia, where it found itself really at the, at the bottom of the totem pole and uh, had a lot of horrors inflicted upon it by the Brits, um, by the French, by the Japanese, most significantly uh, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s by its own people, uh, by the Chinese government and by Mao. And now, after 30 years of economic success, it finds itself back in the place in which it historically views that it deserves. So when you think about how China uh, perceives the rest of the world, it's good to keep in mind that they see themselves, uh, on the one hand, as people who deserve to be where they are, to be very successful, to be a great power, but also that there's a lot of, 
lot of self-confidence issues. Um, one analogy that I've heard before and I think I've used over this trip is if you kind of picture a, you know, someone in, in middle school uh, who gets bullied a lot and then grows up to be very successful, it still carries that baggage with it. And so when China deals with other countries and with other, other institutions, you know, it feels like it deserves being uh, where it is in the center, but it also has that insecurity with it. Personally, just to give you a little background on myself, uh, I first came to China in 2001, uh, in part because I thought it would be a fascinating place where it would, there would always be aspects that would be interesting to me, um, which is true. I mean, it's a, it's a massive country, a uh, lot of really, really great and fascinating things there. Um, and if I had to kind of encapsulate this in an uh, experience that I've had, it was in 2008, right before the Beijing Olympics, and I was waiting for a cab outside of a building called the Capitol Mansions, uh, this very tall, old school office building, and the bellboy, uh, who was probably 60 or 70, you know, waiting outside, and, and we were, we were chit-chatting, and he pointed to a Rolls Royce that was waiting in the parking lot, and he says, you see, Chinese people have money now, too. And there was, such, there was such pride in his face when he said that, but also just this need to communicate to me, you know, a 25-year-old kid standing there waiting for a cab, that Chinese people have money. Uh, Chinese people have returned to their place. Um, so Chinese government, moving from that to Chinese government views of America and how uh, they see the two countries' relationship, uh, there is... You know, I, I feel like, uh, generally speaking, uh, average Chinese very favorable towards America. Uh, official Chinese a little more worried. Uh, there's a lot of fear in Beijing that uh, the U.S. is trying to contain China, uh, is trying to keep China down. I think, um, you know, outside of that, outside of official circles, uh, much more generally positive. Uh, with Japan, unfortunately, it's the opposite. Uh, I think. The government is a little more comfortable with dealing with Japan, uh, but the average Chinese uh, feels a lot of hatred towards Japan. Um, you know, if you look back at the history, Japan was the last country that really made China feel weak, and a lot of people carry that with them. So in the conversations we've had over the last week, a lot of people have been saying, uh, if not that China's system would, would collapse, but that democracy would be a good thing for China. Uh, and while I tend to agree with that, I think if China were to democratize, there's uh, increased risk of conflict with Japan or of war with Japan because public opinion is far more anti-Japanese than government opinion. And you know, on the one hand, the protests that we saw uh, as recently uh, as September were government controlled, but they were also government stopped. So things could have gotten a lot worse if Beijing didn't decide to rein that in. So the way that Chinese, uh, the way that chi uh, Chinese think, the Japanese think about them, uh, you know, there's this fear that Japan feels uh, superior to China. So um, you, know, you get tens of thousands of uh, Chinese who go to North Korea every year. Um, a lot go for tourism. Uh, a lot go to gamble. There's a casino in Pyongyang, which is the closest uh, legal casino for tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of Chinese. So you have this very bizarre sight of a lot of poor Chinese uh, you know, losing their shirts in a basement of a hotel in Pyongyang. Um, but a lot of them go for curiosity as well because they see the way uh, Pyongyang is now is very similar to China in the 70s and 80s. This kind of, you know, this very backward, very inward focused, uh, very poor country. And, uh, you know, Chinese, not only view North Korea that way, but they also use North Korea as a, uh, as a way to make jokes about their own government. Because you can say, you know, you can, you can say something uh, is happening in North Korea, you can be very critical towards its leadership, uh, towards its hereditary leadership, in ways that you can't for Chinese government officials. Um, let's see. So, uh, in a way, this would be great to be able to say how uh, North Koreans view Chinese. Um, we actually have almost no understanding of what North Koreans think 
about anything at all, um, <laughs> which is you know which is unfortunate. Uh, I was talking to someone. There's a man named Alejandro de Benos who runs an organization. I think it's called the North Korean Friendship Association, and he was telling me that the office building that he works on uh, works in in Pyongyang. Uh, he doesn't know what the other offices on the floor above him and the floor below uh, do, and he says that you know a lot of uh, a lot of places in, in Pyongyang don't even have street names uh, because if you don't have a street name, harder to bomb, uh, harder to find out what's going on. Um, so, you know, if he doesn't know any of that, it's very hard for us to understand anything else. But um, one thing that uh, North Koreans and Chinese uh, do do similarly is play this game of access with foreigners. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's a very strong strand of lack of confidence in, uh, in, Chinese, in Chinese official thinking. You know, there's this fear that uh, people are going to look down on them. And I think in uh, a lot of issues with that, you know, they're very careful on who they open up to, uh, both officially and unofficially. And one of the striking things about this trip is the access that we've had with Japanese government officials. Um, just the people who were very comfortable in meeting with us uh, is not something that you'd see in China because there's just a real fear of being misrepresented, uh, fear of being misunderstood. Right, so I'm going to conclude um, just looking at China in, uh, in general. So China, China borders um, 14 countries. It's, it's really it's a very central, um, you know, very central nation, but it doesn't have uh, has very little friends in the international space. Um, so you know, it's you look at America and the relationships it's managed to maintain uh, over the last 20, 30 years. Japan, South Korea, um, a lot of countries in Europe, and you know, China is finally regaining its place in the center. But it doesn't really have any friends. Uh, Pakistan, maybe um, North Korea, maybe Russia, maybe. So it's there, but. It's mostly there alone. Thank you.